Yes. You're, you're great, actually. Um, so what I'd like to do, actually, we're going to take a break, is I just want to orient you to some materials in the binder, so not hard thinking. Now we'll take a little bathroom and refreshment break. Um, and I see Lee hiding over there. Did everybody see the Chalkbeat article that uh, featured Lee and Kathy was in there as well? Um, we, Lee, Kathy, and I uh, did something at the Education Writers Association meeting at Susan in Boston. Um, May something, early May, and uh, and one of the, there's been a few things written out of there, one of the writers uh, did a fabulous piece that had heavily featured uh, Lee's discussion of the water tower task. And so if you don't, I, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, you should. Um, <laughs> and Scott F. Marriott, I tweeted it out yesterday, but I will, uh, I'll, uh, we'll put the link in, uh, in the presentation we're doing this afternoon so people can just go and see it. But it's Pretty cool to share with the public and others. It's uh, it's, it's really well written. So, nice to see. so um, let's not worry about this right now. So in your binder, we have the uh, presentation. I'm not worried about that yet. Um, if you go to uh, tab two, um, you see the uh, it says New Hampshire Pace and there's the uh, performance task framework um, template. That's uh, what Ellen's been talking about in terms of the template. And there's some things about here we're going to talk about as we uh, do our work today. If you go to the next page, just threw this in so you know, this is a little cheat sheet. Um, uh, my advisor was Lori Shepard, very famous in the assessment world. And uh, she and I were sitting around one day and I said, Let's see if we get everything you need to know about assessment on one page. And we'll, we, we don't think you could, uh, but we, we tried. It's a pretty handy little uh, uh, thing. And, and Susan's going to talk uh, some uh, particularly about uh, qualities of good tasks and, and things like that. But just for your you know easy reference, it, it actually has a surprising amount of information on there. If you flip to the next piece, this is a... Uh, this is not just for ELA, but, um, but when you're thinking about uh, text for other content areas as well, uh, Karen Hess who, um, used to be at the center, and this was with folks we worked with in New York City, this group called Aussie, um, and produced this uh, uh, text complexity analysis tool, and that's uh, come in handy, it's very nicely annotated. And then, um, you keep flipping, you see the depth of knowledge wheel, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little simplified here, and, and we have more information on depth of knowledge. But one of the things that we found very clearly, I'll give you an example from math, is that you, I, I, maybe you can, I haven't seen how you could get to a depth of knowledge level three where you want kids to really do some deeper thinking w without integrating the practices fully in the text. You can't get there on content alone. And that, that's a failing, honestly, of the common cores, that they're not intentionally connected, that it's left up to people on their own to figure out how to put them together. But that's something that we're going to do intentionally, and that's really a, an important piece. And, and you could argue the same for science. If you just focus on the, for those of you in the next gen world, the disciplinary uh, uh, content, the, the disciplinary core ideas, um, if you just do that, you're not getting to any kind of depth. You have to in integrate the practices and what they did with the nature of science, the cross-cutting concepts as well. Um, go to the next page. This is a biggie, and this is something that you guys will, uh, this comes up a lot. So we love the teacher's scaffold for their kids, <coughs> right? That's Vygotsky talked about it you know, 100 years ago. Uh, how do you actually bring kids along through that zone of proximal growth? We think that's great. The problem is when you're doing something on a task that's supposed to be common, actually, in reality, even for a task that's summative for your own purposes, for awarding competency for not even common, you want to see what the kid knows how to do. And, um, and so figuring out where, and now you say that uh, that's easy to imagine on a, a half an hour math task. When you're doing a three week project, you, you have to interact with the kids. And so it's figuring out where to draw that line. So we try to um, 
create, we created this little brief. This came up. Susan and I ended up doing a lot of writing last year because an issue would come up. We better write something about this. And so um, and this was with Jerry and Carla as well. We put together this little scaffolding brief. And this is something that's going to be very important for your task template. Because we could create general rules about scaffolding, you know, like it's going to count for the kid's score. The teacher shouldn't be doing half the work, right? Um, it's easy to say in general, but like I said, when you have a three-week task in mean, science or whatever, multi-day, you got to be interactive with the kids and stuff. So you figure out what's going to be scored, what's not going to be scored. Same thing goes for collaborative group work. It's another form of scaffolding. So, and this is a, we don't expect you to read this all today, but you know. I live in Rye, the beach has been lovely. You come down to the beach, bring your little notebook. Uh, uh, and just so you could see that criteria that we use for review, um, the PACE High Quality Assessment Review Tool is follows the scaffolding brief. It's, uh, and so there's some you know, basic checklist stuff. And then um, we go through and we, we try to, uh, just because of the way we are too, we rarely just check the box without writing something and you know, some explanation of why we said you know, partial, unclear, or yes, or no. So um, it's, you know, we go through all aspects of the task. Um, and we're really looking, the thing that would really uh, make a big difference, if the task doesn't, we don't feel like elicits deeper thinking on the part of kids, that's, that's the biggest flag. And I don't think we're going to have that issue this year. Um, and then um, more fun, you, many of you saw Susan and I or others uh, do this demonstration of cognitive labs or think alouds, but you're going to be uh, directing some of that work now. So we have a little uh, cognitive lab or think aloud uh, protocol that for you to use. And then there's a, there's a freebie in here. Um, we haven't really spent much time doing student work analysis. Um, this is, so this is a little analysis protocol that we have put together, we've used very successfully at the center. And it's a way to actually, so what I, what I always say to folks is, is we could talk about tasks and rubrics till they're blue in the face. The student work never lies. And that's really where it comes out there. And so, but looking at it just like from a distance, holistically is one thing. It's another thing to do it with a discipline protocol. And this, we've used it. Oh, we did do it. I, th I thought we did. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's a nice way to really help us get at this. And maybe we'll do some of this in, in June. The last two things, these are truly be treating. Um, you all, uh, so when you have to explain face, you all should have seen this, right, already. And I have a, a very embarrassing thing to admit, and it's only been caught by a couple of people. But if you go to the last page of it, um, there's red and blue bars as, as if they're uh, designating different things, and they are designating different things. And I swear it was right in the, in the piece that I sent to the printer. I don't know where it got screwed up. I, my fault, because I should have caught it when I looked at the page proofs. But the blue lines, are, the blue bars are really, it should be pace. I say pace, instead of S back at every right. So I only have about 500 more of these to get rid of. They'll get reprinted. <laughs> have the updated results. But anyway, this is a nice explanation if you have to uh, talk about PACE with your public. And you guys are going to be part of the public face of PACE now. Um, and so that's a, it'll be a handy resource. And then the last two things. This is, uh, this is truly, uh, I tried to limit the amount of uh, truly like extra reading. But, but what we're trying to do today. What's that? You broke two printers. Oh, we could have printed it. I'm um, sorry. Um, but uh, so Mary Ann Starr is saying that we do trust that you guys have some very deep experience and knowledge about your content area and about task development and, and implementation. Um, we're going to try to take you to a deep, bless you, to a deeper level of that so that you are really experts, especially by the end of this year. And, and you know, right, the, the best way to become expert to something is to have to teach it, right? And so, uh, so we're trying to help with some of that foundational stuff. And, and so when we start talking about things like evidence-centered design today, and uh, which can be incredibly complex or 
hopefully not as complex when we talk about it. We wanted to provide some background. So this uh, one little paper, um, yeah, looks good. it says excerpted from Pellegrino and Chodowski, uh, the Foundations of Assessment. Um, it's it's, it's ex excerpted from this article, which is really excerpted from this uh, really game-changing book in our field, 2001, called Knowing What Students Know. And uh, Knowing What Students Know was written by a National Research Council committee. And as, as Jim Pellegrino, who uh, we might get here to uh, come talk about uh, some of the stuff, he's, uh, he's a good friend, well, uh, has said, they wrote Knowing What Students Know to explain evidence-centered design to the masses. And it's, but it took a whole volume to do it. Uh, but it's, this is like five pages of some of the key ideas of what we call principled assessment design. We're going to talk more about that. But this is, you know, so if you don't, if, if, I, if I bore you to death and we start talking about it, I said, what was he talking about? It's, you have five pages of it to catch up. And then I think, and again, I'm biased because she was my advisor and still a good friend. Lori Shepard has this article that was actually uh, the role of assessment in the learning culture. Right, competency-based education is a learning framework. It's not an assessment framework. And so, um, Lori does this fabulous job of, of in, in very, really not many pages. This was her. Uh, she was the president of the American Educational Research Association in 2001. This was in 2000. This was her presidential address. It got turned into this article, and um, I've shared this article with hundreds of people and, and almost everybody finds it enlightening to think about where we came from as, as a field and, and where we're trying to go. You know, we did a, we were very good at uh, Bob Mislevy, who we'll talk about shortly, says that uh, modern measurement is really uh, 21st century statistics applied to 19th century psychology. And what Lori actually talks about here is, is how we try to bring, bring the the, the learning part up into the 21st, 20, 21st century, and how to go from connecting from classroom to this larger scale stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a great piece. So this is truly be treating, but um, and, and I'd love to hear what you think about it. So with that, why don't we take a 10 minute, 15 minute, 10 minute break. So let's come back at uh, 10, 20. So we're gonna get started. Um, so just uh, quickly, uh, uh, let me get out of the way here. The, uh, this LibGuide, uh, this is the link that Ellen was just talking about. This is the administrative LibGuide link, you sent me right? That's different no, that's from the one that's the here. Oh, uh, this is the task. It's a content link guide. Okay, so this is the content link. Anyone guide. can look at it. It's not Okay. Okay. And then um, this is the. Uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll email this out to everyone so you don't have to try to copy that link. This is the uh, link to the story uh, with Lee and Kathy in there. Um, it's, it's actually it's a great read. So um, what we're going to talk about today? So we, this is how this is going to go. We're, we're going to talk about uh, assessment design issues from up until lunch. And then we'll have lunch, uh, informal discussion. And then, uh, Mary Ann has prepared a great set of slides on, uh, and, and talking points on facilitation. Because you know, it's one thing to know the stuff. It's another thing to actually get it, people to you know, work with you. I heard this great line, right? If, uh, you know, if, if you think you're a leader and you turn around, nobody's following with you, you're just a person on a walk. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, uh, and so uh, Marianne has some really nice uh, uh, sort of hints and, and, and thoughts about how to do it. So that'll be right after lunch, and then we'll. Uh, it's pretty cool, not the end of the day, but uh, we'll then finish with going back and looking at task quality again. So uh, Susan and I will be in these, in these two parts, um, and so. A lot of this stuff is I'll go through quickly, like why performance assessments. If you're here, you already uh, have an understanding of why. A little bit about validity. I was I'm not even going to use the word validity, but we'll, we'll talk about it very briefly. And then what we're going to spend most of the time is on this notion of principled assessment design. That's not principal, like the AL is principal. Um, 
and then uh, and then uh, what uh, Susan will focus on uh, after uh, Mary Ann's talk after lunch is, is identifying criteria for for judging assessment quality, which is really you're going to, it's going to be the gatekeeper. We're going to have uh, a bunch of practice before lunch on certain aspects. I'll have a lot of practice after lunch. In other words, you're not just going to get stuck listening to us. So I love this quote from uh, Phil Schleckley, who actually died this year. So if you haven't read his books, uh, Shaking Up the Schoolhouse is a phenomenal book. And, and this is really what we're about with PACE, right? It's, we want students to interact meaningfully with content, and we're eventually then going to judge them to be well-educated. And if you think about uh, a lot of the work in New Hampshire, around uh, assessment, accountability, reforms, are, are organized around um, Dick Elmore's assess, um, uh, uh, instructional core, sorry, I think about too many triangles, Pellegrino. instructional core, right? Who, who he says the only way they're actually gonna have any kind of improvement at scale is just that you, ha you have to deal with this core of, of instructional quality, meaningful content, and engaged students. All the other stuff is on the periphery. And you know, if you're just focusing on the, like the schedules and buses and this and that, you're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. If you actually want to actually <laughs> bring about reform and you're not dealing directly with the quality of instruction provided, the meaningfulness of the content and the engagement of the students, you're not going to get anywhere. And I think Phil Schleckley says it really well. So we're trying to create tasks and experiences that, and, and the beauty is you're doing it. I don't know if those of you have seen the videos being uh, captured by Bill Duncan and the uh, other folks at the New Hampshire Learning Initiative from, from your students about the way that they talk about the, the, the work that they're doing, the level of engagement is, is phenomenal. And as a, you don't really hear kids talking about that at the end of the Smarter Balanced Test, right? You know, uh, so it, we're getting there. We're making great progress. And so this is again, this is I'm preaching to the converted here, right? It's uh, it takes more time. It's hard to do well. So why do it, right? There's lots of reasons, and and, and I'm not going to torture you with this because you're here. Um, the, the one thing that we have to be clear though is we we want to call these things authentic, right? Or uh, and, and they're not true by definition. It's not like say, I have a performance assessment, therefore it measures higher order thinking. No, that has to be designed in intentionally. Right? It's, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't just simply make it so because we could call it a performance assessment that it's getting at higher level skills. Um, you know what, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's, uh, we do care about, though, what we care about is, right, we can't ever peel back the, well, not legally, peel back the kids' heads and see what's really going on in there, right? We don't have these direct measures, like we're trying to measure their height, weight, even though, as you might argue, are even indirect a little bit, but they're still a lot more direct than we do with assessment. I want to know somebody, how well they're doing in reading comprehension. That's this sort of a little bit of an amorphous trait anyway. Like, what does it really mean? What does reading comprehension really mean? What does a deep understanding of the nature of science really mean? It's, so we're, we're always working in this inferential world. The science folks should be feel at home. And so when I say that a kid scored 240 on test A, or they think I scored a level three on this rubric, that carries some meaning, right? When I said, kid scores a three versus a four, or three versus a two. You're, you're thinking in your head, it's not just a number that I'm rank or in putting in a place. I'm thinking that they must know a certain amount or they must not know a certain amount. And so I'm making inferences about what they know and are able to do. And uh, so I'm making an inference from that score to something that I think that score represents on that particular exam or assessment. And that is harder than you think to do well. The next thing is the part we really care about is if a student scores a three on one task, I might be happy because it's a good task and I think that they demonstrated some work, but 
they're probably not going to do that task ever again. And so if that task represents the ability to construct a, a defensible argument, and they showed me that they could do it, is do I, do I want to make the inference that they could construct an argument when faced with other situations? I would like to get there that I, I, I could believe that this is not just a one and done. But that takes evidence because all I have is the one and done. And so oftentimes you need to have multiple tasks to support this generalization. I don't care that a kid just passed my final exam. I care that that actually represents something that they know and can do about biology or whatever <coughs> other subject I'm teaching. And so that's when we move to this level of generalization. And this is what we're going to, this is getting weedy, I know, but this is, this is why, this is why we're so annoying, actually, it's really one of the reasons. <laughs> we're always thinking about not just can they do this task, not just can they produce the score, but ultimately what does that represent? And, and that's why in PACE, the beauty is it's not a one and done thing, right? We're collecting evidence throughout the year. And so we're trying to substantiate these judgments to say that when I say that a kid is competent or highly competent or whatever labels you use, that it means something beyond that, that individual task, even that set of tasks. It means something about the nature of an argument or the nature of science or mathematical reasoning. So it's about, it's about transfer. That's, so that's actually beautiful, right? So in, uh, <laughs> in learning, we talk about transfer. In, in assessment, we talk about generalization. They are exactly the same coin, just the two different sides. And transfer uh, as, as, is hard, right? And near, so there's one thing I can think about near transfer, right? I'm going to give you a math problem. See if you could do two digit addition. <clears throat> and you could do it with 22 plus 42. Now I'm going to give you 63 plus 25. Oh, you could do that too. Now I'm starting to get a sense that you actually are starting to uh, do many of those, right? That you're grasping. So that's pretty near transfer. Then if I'm going to ask you to actually apply that to solve the problem that involves that, now I'm getting to a little further transfer. And so People talk, and it's, it's important to think about that. We're, we're very good in education at near transfer, and giving kids experience to do near transfer. And the beauty of these performance assessments is we hope it actually produces the kind of knowledge that they can use in the real world that would be further transfer. And so um, that's a, a little further level of generalization on the, on the measurements of it. That's exactly right. Transfer is the, is the learning equivalent of generalization. And I actually meant to say that. So. Please, please keep jumping in. Um, and so this is, um, so this might sound strange, and, and, and don't feel bad, because I know a lot of folks in, in our field who still think that our job in test design is just to match questions to standards. And you're going to say, well, isn't that what we're supposed to do? <coughs> sort of, but not really. Because that takes us from a, just a sampling frame. That's like calling 400 households to find out who they plan to vote for. That's just a sampling idea. And it get, tells us something, but it might not tell us anything meaningful about the reasons why we're making inferences. Because one of the things I care about, for instance, on a transfer, is where kids are. As you know, as you see kids progress from fragile understanding to much deeper understanding, their ability to transfer gets further away from the actual thing. Right? As you can't transfer until you have deeper understanding of the content area. And so we, this uh, notion of principled assessment design is a way to actually build in an interpretive framework for the, for the data in the design phase. Uh, we'll talk more about this. Um, so I already told you that Bob Mislavi had this great line that you know, uh, modern measurement is, is 21st century statistics applied to 19th century psychology. And we didn't, um, we didn't really attend to how people learn. It's however they learned it, that was fine. We're just going to give some tests. People you know, going from this notion of trait psychology, like everything was an IQ measurement, that's where our field started. Right? It was all about measuring intelligence and, and, and just these traits that are pretty fixed. 
it, it grew up a little bit, but it really stuck in, in older theories of learning, like behaviorism, that it, you just accumulate bits of knowledge and eventually you could do the thing. You come to know that it's not really true. So here's the, I'm gonna give you a, so there's been volumes written around ECD, evidence-centered design. I'm gonna give it to you in two slides. Um, there are these three components, interconnected components. There's the student model, the evidence model, and the task model. And, and the reason why we're gonna obsess about this a little bit, I'll obsess about it, hopefully you'll join in the obsession. Um, Folks, we saw a lot of the workshops last year were, I have a task, let's see if we could fit it to what we want to do this year. And it's, it was the tail wagging the dog. And um, I've seen that a lot in, uh, on the um, educator evaluation side of student learning objectives. People say, I got a test, let me try and retrofit a learning objective to that. It's the same thing here is if you have a great test, that's great, but let's get clear what we're trying to, to measure first. So the student model, and is, well, we're gonna work through this, it's not just gonna talk to you about it, right? Is you think about exactly what do you want the students to know and how well do you want them to know? Them. And so it's not just the standards. We have the standards that describe uh, the, the features, the content, if you will, of argumentative writing at that particular grade. The standards are pretty poor at baking in the performance expectation. They tell you the what pretty well, but they don't really tell you what it looks like in, in terms of a level of performance. And so when we talk about the student model, it, it, this is this, um, uh, hopefully more than a science folks, but this is really, it's generating testing hypotheses all the time is what we're doing here, right? And so in this case, I have this pretty clear description of what it is I want kids to know. So when, when Ellen talks about we want kids to be able to construct an argumentative essay and uh, based on uh, primary source documents, right? I could keep probing with her and she'll be able to keep answering my probes because she has deep understandings. But what is it actually you want these 10th graders to do? What is that argument going to look like? Well, it'll be constructed in this way. It'll, it'll have these kind of features. The kids should be able to reason and, and uh, counterfactual evidence and, and uh, contributing evidence and things like that. And so the, the advantage we have working in this competency framework is the competencies do try to focus on these bigger ideas and do try to include some performance level of performance expectation. Um, so, so I don't mean this in a bad way. We, we have to even go more than taking the competencies on face value. We start from the competencies, but then we actually say, what does that really mean? for a fourth grader to know and be able to understand some key issues around proportions, right? And, and, and you guys could all do that. I mean, we've seen you all do that. And we're gonna have some practice with that. And this is the missing step, usually. And so it's usually we say, I got the competency, now I gotta get a task. But we don't often think about this, is before you think about the task, we kinda, uh, you're on this, again, you're on this evidentiary hunt. What evidence would convince you that a kid is actually able to construct a solid defensible argument at the 10th grade level? What evidence would convince you that a student understands uh, the basics of the theory of natural selection and could apply it to different uh, cases that are presented before them? Or that they really understand how to, how to apply proportions when it comes to solving uh, various types of math problems? What's the evidence that would convince you that the student really understands it in the way that you think it represents it in that student model, right, that level of construct. Then, finally, once you, and this is where the task design becomes easier. So you actually specify that evidence, and think, now, I'm a scientist, how do I collect that evidence? What are my protocols that I'm gonna to use to collect that evidence? Well, I'm gonna design a, uh, so if I said that, Part of my evidence statement was that for a student to really uh, demonstrate their understanding of uh, uh, constructing an argumentative essay from primary source documents, as part of my evidence statement, I'm gonna be talking about, well, it really requires multiple primary source documents and it requires some that are, uh, give conflicting evidence and some that give counterfactual evidence. 
things like that. So now I've already thought about the nature of the evidence. So now when I'm constructing my task, if I only give them one primary source, my, my task and my evidence don't match. Right? So it, it leads me into task design very nicely. It's, it's very different, and we've seen this. If you start with the task, you end up trying to retrofit the, your evidence statements and your task models. Let me stop for questions. What's he talking about? <laughs> we live for this stuff. So. I, I think okay. that something that was really eye-opening this year was actually collecting the, the student evidence portfolios from teachers for um, per content area and grade level. I, most people were probably involved in that, but we were able to lay them all out and look at the evidence that we depend on it as teachers yeah. to show that these students have confidence right. in this area. And I thought it was a really good activity exactly. looking at that. Yeah. That is a, it's a yeah. collection of evidence, and uh, so, so, so there are skills and there's content knowledge, yeah. and um, sometimes I get worked up about, um, as a teacher, the content knowledge piece, but what I'm hearing from what you just said about what do we want the students to be able to know and transfer, now we're talking about skills, nature science practices, much more so than the idea that an atom has protons and neutrons and electrons. So how do, how do those mush together in what this model that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so I don't think, if I said it, if it sounded that way, I didn't quite mean it that way. Because I nobody does inquiry about nothing. Right. right? There's always some content there. It better be. Right? Um, and that's why I often say, people say, oh, we're doing an inquiry task. And we could just do it in any subject area because still inquiry. It makes a difference how well you know the content to be able to do the inquiry. And so the, it, the critical content, so just to carry your example, I think former biology teacher and chemistry teacher obsessed about the content, right? And to me, what I realized when I was sort of teaching, I was teaching a little bit, it felt like, you know, it's like to drive at night in a snowstorm. Right, and, and the lights are illuminating all the snowflakes, and they're just coming at you with like no apparent organization. And that's what I felt like when I was looking at these biology textbooks. It was just like this driving through this, just like snowflakes with no order, right? And so we, we have to, as teachers, it would be nice if the materials did a better job, actually provide some structure of the discipline. And the structure that the NGSS is trying to do that, right? It's weaving together the the science and engineering practices and the content and these big ideas. And so when we think about what does it mean to be competent, and the competencies are really trying to do that, I would say in science, where the, the math and English language arts do a little better job of this, and the competencies, they, they do bake in content along with the skills. The science is much heavily, more heavily focused on the, the big ideas, the cross-cutting concepts in science. So we have to decide what content is critical for a student to know and be able to do. But as you know, to be a to think like a scientist, be scientifically literate, it's not just knowing content because we know that tomorrow there's going to be new content, and the day after there'll be twice as much new content. And so, what did Linda Darling have and tell me the other day that there's been more knowledge? I think Linda makes this stuff up sometimes, but I, 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 I love her. But uh, there's more knowledge created since 1998 till now than there has been from like the beginning of human knowledge until that. 1998. Yeah, yeah. That, it's a great thing to say. I, but but the idea is that right, there's new knowledge created, so we have to actually teach people how to how to be work in the discipline. And so, but you do need the content, and that's why you guys are the keepers of the content because I I don't agree that just any content works. It's the critical content that you think is like the higher leverage content. When, but in any of these student models, and I'm going to show you one, there's the content and the skills that go together that actually make that usable knowledge. Does that make sense to you? But I do wonder, I, I wondered about this when we were giving our assessments this year because, and more specifically when we were scoring them, <clears throat> because there was room for a tremendous variability in 
content knowledge within the same school as as scored by the rubric. And so I we asked my co-teacher and I, and we wondered if there was room in the rubric or should there be a place in the rubric for more specificity about what is expected in terms of content and knowledge. So the performance assessment was great because you couldn't do the performance assessment without some content fluency, but you know, I could have one student who understood, calculated, graphed, compared co coefficient of friction to another student who said, these two things sliding together have less friction than these two things sliding together. So there's a you know a clear difference in the sophistication of their understanding, but they carried out the nature of science in the same way and therefore got the same score. So there was there was no real differential in terms of their score based on their content. Right. Um, and that was the same things that were incorrect. Right. Yeah. It was like saying things that were incorrect, like really lower their score but just right. not saying something. So that's where this specification of this student model, what is it that we want students to know and do that we're designing a task around, right? And if we don't specify that we want them to be able to use mathematics at the appropriate grade level to calculate uh, efficient solutions, then, then we miss the boat on, on, on holding them accountable for that because we didn't include that in what we expect them to know. And the evidence model should describe what's the nature of evidence that's going to say that this kid knows that. And if it's just rubbing together two blocks is enough, then we've said it. But that's where it, it's, a, it's a highly specified activity. And so we, and then we actually need to then look at the rubrics to see if they're capturing what we're trying that's to do. Really but, but if we haven't it's specified it up front, right. if we're trying to, I always say this, you can't fix lousy standards with good assessment. You can't fix lousy assessments with a good accountability system. And the same thing is here. You can't fix a lousy assessment with a good rubric. It's just, you got a but good you rubric. you ruin a good assessment with a bad rubric. Easily. That's it. It's, it's a very conjunctive rule we have here. Everything's got to be good. You want to say something? Yeah. Um, we did identify, and when I say we, I mean Scott, Susan, Marianne, Ellen, team. We did identify that there were differences in the expectations around the balance of foundations of the content area and content knowledge specificity across the content areas. And that's one of the things that Ellen is going to tighten up on, that we want each of the content areas to have that foundational practices piece, nature of science, foundations of, of English language arts and math practices. But we also want the rubrics to be specific to the task and those uh, content knowledge um, sophistications that students at that level of learning need to exhibit. So, um, so this year we will be building, you will be building both. Yeah, I think we had the opposite problem in math, right? We were too specific at times in math that we, it was preventing us from seeing the bigger picture. Science. Yeah. yeah, and we had just the opposite where we did right. because we <laughs> used we used the same rubric 9, 10, 11 for life science, chemistry, and biology. Uh, you know, and physics, and and you know we didn't put any content into the rubric, the rubric at all. Right, and that's something that we can address. Yeah. There's there's this tension in general in the field and among us, uh, uh, general versus specific, task specific rubrics and certain advantages to general rubrics in that they make the expectations clear across tasks. They become sometimes harder to score for that. So even with a general rubric, you could have what we call training notes or task annotations and things like that. That's why ultimately what Kathy asked earlier, are we going to have these annotated papers? And then you really you're not engaged in scoring, you're engaged in matching. Does this, does this student paper look more like this one or this one? And that is all, if, if those anchors are really solid, it helps bring the rubric alive. But this really goes to one of the things that I think the teachers are feeling about the project, that 
Um, it's valuable to do a performance assessment. Uh, you do find out some things, but when they're embedded in what you're learning in units of study, they, they the value triples for exactly. you in is firing out information, right? So exactly. um, I think this year was a, an example of how we swayed a little bit more to the accountability piece. And we need to swing back to the content and the embedded in the unit. And it really does come down to when's the best. I think one of the things that's hindered everyone, in, it started as a good thing, right? We're very serious about this. We all want to produce an excellent product. We're taking this seriously. But PACE, the assessment itself, is one small piece of this project. It's a great piece. It's our calibration piece. But there was this real rush to do everything at the end of the year, for instance. You know, so that's, a, that's another thing as teams say, you know, say to yourself, maybe we need to do one in the fall so we know where kids stand on these, uh, these secure skills. And, I mean, is that a better place to do it? Because that is okay. Um, because we're not using this pace assessment as a way to evaluate our whole district. It isn't doing that. So I think taking a step back from that a little bit and really embedding what we're studying, what's important in, in our so the kids feel the connection. Because we've said all along we know kids will perform better on things that they were going to be doing that are valuable to their grade rather than this event outside of their lives that has nothing to do with their course. So I'm going to swing the pendulum back to curriculum. Well, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's really, the, that is where the importance of this, you'll read that in Laura Shepard's article or thinking about this CD or evidence and design. It is it's connected intentionally to the way in which students learn. And so you can't have, you could, but they're not great, these curriculum agnostic assessments because we all, we have to embed it somewhere. We just sort of drop from the sky. Well, and, and that's why, you know, when you said, what do we want students to be able to know and do? And then what is the evidence we want to see? There's a disconnect between the content knowledge and the skill piece to, like, what I want them to know and do, and then the accountability model, like you were saying, was the, the hindrance part, because uh, now I'm trying to say, I want them to be able to mathematically calculate this, and then I'm looking for where in my rubric it says it, and it's not there, and I go, but that's what I want them to know and do, and so there was the breakdown for, to some extent, even though we had lists and we had annotations and we all did it the same, and we, there was a lot of validity in what we did and we were very excited about it. But this rubric part of it, this end piece, it drove the task development more than it should have. So here's, I mean, this is, we say this a lot, but we just keep saying it in hopes that you're, because you're interacting now with the teachers most closely. The, the accountability, Pace common task because it's all pace, right? The yeah. of yeah. common task is this is what it is. Is when when you score a paper in Sauhegan level two, and then independent teachers from elsewhere also look at that and score a two, that's a good thing. If you scored a three and the independent folks scored a two, then that's an issue. It's a bigger issue if you scored a four, uh, and this is a consistent mm -hmm. average, and everybody else mm -hmm. scores a two. That's all we're really looking at, right? It's not how does Sauhegan kid, how do Sauhegan kids on average do compared to Rochester kids or Concord kids. It's just when you say it's a two in your local district, do other independent raters say it's a two? And that's as that that's really as simple as it, it, it's simple and as truthful as it is. It's just. Are we on this? Are we are we holding kids to the same expectations? And as this, then we're making we're making inference, right? If this is how it works on the common task, we're we're suggesting that's probably how it works on other tasks. We're actually going to do some verification of that. So Scott, I, I believe in the drive-by theory that you have to drive by three or four times saying the same thing before it sticks, because I think that some people got a message in the work previous to this that it was that that wasn't. It was more than that. So can you just say it one more time? Yeah, it's simply a way uh, to <laughs> just, right? It, it's just a way to, it's like the internal calibration that yeah. you're doing. Like when you do double score, yeah. you're not looking to see how my class did compare to Marianne's class. So you're seeing, given the same piece of work, 
is Marianne a more stringent score than Scott? And how do we get on the same page so we're holding the same expectations for our kids? Now we're just taking that across districts. And I've heard you say that several times, and you say it exactly the same way every <laughs> single time. And so it's just like very a wind up talk, right? <laughs> well, and it's very clear when I'm in these meetings that I know exactly what your expectation right. is. I think down the grapevine, yeah. that expectation changes. Yeah. And because I know in my building, the I have specifically been told that that is our assessment just like the smart Balance. Yeah. That, is, that is how the this. state is assessed. We've got a slide? <laughs> I've got a slide for this. Well, it's actually in here, too. It is in here. But I would love for you guys to go to my bed and say that it is I'll say it. Well, we get them on tape. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, your PACE annual determinations. So, at the end of the year, what all comes out of your work all year long, your competency work in your districts with your students, is a level one, a level two, a level three, a level four, just like you would get for smarter balanced, except there's not that scale score element to it, right? So that goes back to your students, it goes back to the parents, it goes to your uh, boards of ed. Um, what goes into that are your district competency scores and your local performance assessments that inform those competency scores. It's not all performance assessments, we realize that in all the districts, there's some summatives mixed in there that are more traditional looking, but in general, in PACE, we're, we're changing the way we do learning and assessment. So it should be predominantly performance assessments, including one of these PACE common assessments, right? And so that feeds into one or more of informing your local competency scores, but it's not counted any extra or different, it's not weighted separately than your regular competency scores that you submitted to your district leads that are then submitting to the states. Okay, so PACE common task really informs three purposes. So the first purpose is to organize things like this and build a cohort of experts so you can go all out and build assessment capacity and assessment literacy among all of the educators ultimately that are participating in this enterprise. It's also to eventually build out a bank of high quality assessments that have been reviewed and vetted, gone through this really high quality task development process that you can ultimately pull from to inform your local performance assessments, right? So we don't do the same common task every single year and every single grade level. The reason is we are hoping to establish a large bank that you can pull from to keep using Right, because you've developed these tasks, you believe in these tasks, you've seen what they've done for your instruction and your students, so you want to keep using them even though there's a new PACE task or a common task every year. Right? And then the third reason is, as what Scott was just talking about, is these calibration activities. To ensure, since we don't have that external assessment like Smarter Balanced in every grade level, we need to make sure that when we call a kid proficient or a level three in Rochester or in Epping or in Concord, that student, had they presented the same evidence of proficiency, would have also been called proficient in Sauhegan or Monroe or, or any of the other districts. Right, so that's the only purpose. Chris? The, should the Smarter Balance also feed the district level competency score as well? I don't see it. No. It's just no. an outside no. audit. Because <laughs> it doesn't, because the PACE common task, right, you're embedding it in instruction. Right. You're using it as, Grading, you're giving kids a grade, you're giving a feeding into a competency determination. I don't think anybody's using smart and balanced in that way, right? And so it's just this, it's like a dark cloud up there, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually really important to the validity really of this whole thing, right? So this year we'll be creating annual determinations even for those students that didn't have a PACE common task. So we'll be able to directly compare, okay, this student in third grade reading was proficient on smarter balance. Were they actually also proficient according to our method of doing this with pain? It's a really good important check for this project. So it's not just uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have no idea how hard we fight with the US Department of Ed to keep the double testing to just these three grades. They would love to see it in every grade. We say that would kill it. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question because we're kind of on the topic. It might be a question more for Marianne or Ellen, if 
you guys could tell me to hold it for later if it makes sense. But one thing I was wondering, because we're in the first few years of task development, we're trying to get a lot of tasks in the bank so we can use them later. Um, but one thing that I've noticed is once we actually do the task, like anything else, we usually have a lot of feedback, right? Mm -hmm. We can come back and we would be able to then make it stronger if we were going to then teach it again. Mm -hmm. But it seems that our focus is like, okay, but we got to get the next year's task and we got to do the next year. We have so much on our plate right now. What I would like to see is maybe some time set aside to reflect in that way and go back. So, okay, is the, you know, year 15, 16 ELA task just in the bank now and that's it and it stays as it is, even though I can bet that a lot of people have some feedback that we could then make that better and I'd like to see that happen before those are then just in there and used um, and before we get too far away from it that we've sort of forgotten. It was nice that. to have two years in a row with the same time. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, the, that's what we're trying to do with the pilot and that's why we built yeah. in that piloting yeah. and so hopefully but you, you're right, yeah. you could pilot it, you'll learn some stuff, and then you do it again. It's like I say about teaching, right? Not until you teach something at least three times, you actually start to figure it out. And, and so, it, but realistically, we expect once they're in the bank and you're using it for local purposes, you're gonna make some adjustments on your own anyway. Yeah. And people just do that by nature, right? But, but you might also say, no, I think it was pretty good. I have these annotated work samples that I want to use. So we would actually say, but it, the idea is a good one to revisit. But if yeah, it was going to be used like, in an official way, like one of the, it's kind of embarrassing, but the easy move task, so many people saw it. Lots of eyes saw yeah. that thing, and there was an error in the formula mm -hmm. that error hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people used. And if we were going to use it officially again, I wouldn't want that error. There right. Again. Do you well, know what I mean? We, well, we should correct. We shouldn't wait for anything. We yeah. should just correct that error. So okay. if you know about that. Yeah. We should let's no, correct that. Our, our intention is for the tasks that are administrated, administered one year, that will go in the task bank for local use the following year. We will co always collect feedback after an administration year. So we always want that feedback. We don't want it going into the task bank for local use with known errors. Okay. So when do we collect that feedback? I'm going to build a formal process for the team okay. to do that. So two years from the administration, we would not continue to collect feedback. But every mm -hmm. year after administration, we do. But, but you know that you, I've, at least I've been sort of waiting and sitting on that information because I don't know when it is most appropriate and whether we're going to do it in a time when we together but if it's simply I need to send that information to you yeah. Ellen. Yep. I I'm going to create a survey for us to weigh in on all our tasks, identify a task, I'll do that so everyone has a chance. And if they're you know editorial things then it doesn't really need to go to a whole committee but if they're like con major conceptual things then you'd want to say let's bring together some science experts. Most of the small group. Yeah. 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 But you know the, the anchor papers are going to, it, it, um, chicken before the egg kind of issue here like so know that I'm in, in we've done the pilot task and we have a, a pile of student work that we might use but we change the task based on the work so the so anchor paper is a result of the so, so now I change task right 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 and so then next year we take the <clears throat> we do it and we don't have an anchor paper really because we've changed the task from the pilot and now we've got the summer comes up and now we, we identify the anchor papers but now we have these anchor papers and we say oh if we had just changed this little piece or you know because now we've we've really pushed it out to the the whole group and now we have a much bigger statistical pool that we're using to get our anchor papers out of um, we've already graded them by the way by the time we get what the anchor papers are. Um, so it's almost like we should really consider maybe having an a, uh, every two year task as opposed to an every year task. Like a two year pilot? Like, like, a, like pilot at once? No, like, a, like pilot it. 
run it as a full-blown task, run it the second year as a full-blown task with the modifications to it, and then you could statistically look at how different they were and I yeah, I mean, it's, 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 we're always going to be, because we're perfectionists, right? that's why you're all here. We're always going to want to say, ah, if I just change that word. And the reality is, we have to look at that, that, the task, the student work that was identified as potential anchors. Depending on what you changed, they could still be anchors for certain dimensions of the rubric, right? So it wouldn't necessarily start it from scratch. Now, if, you, if we said, man, this we should have caught it in the think a lot if the task didn't work at all. That would be a disaster to get all the way to the field test. We should have caught that earlier. Um, but sometimes you don't. That's just life. And um, then you say, yep, all the anchor papers are garbage. You've got to start all over again. That's, I think, going to be a rare event. And so depending on how much we change the task, we would want to build a pool of new anchors. But it wouldn't mean like the old ones were useless, perhaps. I can't. Can't say that for sure until they you know know what kind of. Yeah, it, it's just that I think we found that there were things that we didn't. Yeah. That we didn't see, and so we changed the task to have those be there, and then. Right. I, th I think we're in also in a position where we started this project, and so I'll, I'm going to speak for ELA. We have a grade five ELA task. We do not want to revisit it. We don't want to ever go back. <laughs> are, we, are we clear? Sick of that All right. I mean, I, I, and, and here is the reason why we are different assessors than when we started. Yeah. No amount of tweaking and editing right. is going to make that a better assessment. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so the the question becomes your idea, and, and I think it's worth really entertaining. We're we're different now. We're we definitely have learned a lot. So, what is our protocol going forward? Because I think each content area might say. You know, that easy move, that's a good assessment. We want to keep that one. We, we believe we need another year for that assessment because it's worth the investment, right? When, would you flip for the circus? Not so much. <laughs> okay? Uh, because, no, because it's just, it, 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 we know we're different now. Yeah. Our next one was so good. I mean, we, we just, we just right. evolved no, I, so I, I much. So Definitely. it may be a content by content judge, and I think that that's something that this team would be saying, you know, listen, this one's real, it really got to what we needed, you know, or maybe we go at it with a different question, but we have the same, we can use some elements of the same. Or, so. we, or, or in your survey that solicits feedback, yeah. um, maybe every teacher that does it has a five minute survey they have to take yep. and then grade yeah. the task yeah. based on the survey and yeah. I'm gonna make that's assessments. I know. Yep. <laughs> I actually would love to see, I don't know about the other disciplines, but for our, our discipline, is, it's so much about the process, and I would love to see materials and time to do the task ourselves. Write the task, write the rubric, and then go through the task. And because I, I feel like that could elucidate a lot of the things that are missing in the rubric that we don't discover until we're looking at student work in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was part of the process that other teachers not involved were supposed to do that. I just don't know how extensively I did. And then the think aloud, of course, you're not necessarily getting to scorable work, especially for these longer tasks. You can't do it. But, but yeah, all these ideas are great ideas, and then we just have to prioritize them and manage them. And people could do it differently. So that's that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. In math, we had two groups creating tasks simultaneously. And at some point during the development days, we switched tasks. And so I did yeah. your task, you did my task, and then we could reflect on what worked well. And then so you performed elements of strength. Yeah. yeah. So you did the task as a student would. Yes. yes. OK, cool. Yeah, we didn't do that in ELA. Right. Right. That's that's tough. Like that. Science and ELA have yeah. are a little bit of a disadvantage yeah. Yeah. there, because they tend to be much longer tasks. I'm not going to set up a lab. Something that says, I'm thinking big picture, um, while we're here in a full group of, of K to 12, um, from someone who works with little people, you know, I think we're talking about our own growth, and then we're talking about growing, and I know as a coach, um, trying to expand the assessment literacy of the teachers I work with, but also um, expanding the assessment literacy of our youngest students. You know, uh, helping them understand that this is an exit ticket, this is a quick check, this is, but this is a performance assessment, and this is where you're going all out, and here's how you can, you know, uh, respond mathematically using different mathematical symbols and using uh, uh, symbolic representation and in word form. So I think 
from a, 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 an elementary perspective, I'm also hoping that years down the road, you that work with older kids will be getting students who have been experienced in these types of assessments um, and, and that you'll see the, the results of that down the road. I think that can't be <coughs> diminished, the importance yeah, of yeah. the students themselves from the youngest of ages understanding what a rubric is and being able to follow a rubric and score papers on their own and practicing those things. And understand their own learning and their yeah, own feedback. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, we, uh, this is a great conversation. I don't want to cut it short. We have lunch for these kind of conversations as well. I want to give you one example of this ECD. Um, it's not that I'm being biased about science, but I'm pulling it from the AP, and that's where. So Bob Mislev and his colleagues sort of started writing about this in the early 90s. And it really wasn't until, like I said, Knowing What Students Know was published in 2001. People so started becoming a little more accessible. And then uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Kristen Huff, um, was really led the uh, AP redesign, brought in a lot of folks in the early 2000s where they started the first cases where we started to see ECD in practice. And then and it just stayed in AP for the most, maybe a few little boutique programs. But it wasn't really until uh, Park and Smarter Balance with the assessment consortium and then uh, Nixic is the uh, is one of the assessment consortium for the uh, uh, kids with the most significant cognitive disabilities, the alternate assessments, um, where we really started seeing this in, in larger scale practice. It's still not necessarily a full evidence centered design model, but I think a lot of the ways that people have been designing assessments, and, and so you can say what you want about the race to the top funding for assessment, but it actually did actually push uh, this this more principal design into practice. So I'm going to give you one. Um, a little example. So this is on, uh, on doing the student model. So you have these subject matter experts perform, they do a domain analysis. And we have, we're starting in this case from the competencies, but they identify and prioritize important aspects of the domain, both the content and the skills you know, that you need to interact, going back to Sue's question, with the content. And then they create these claims and evidence statements that uh, really try to bring to bear how students learn and, and how they will demonstrate that learning. I don't know how well you can see this. Um, and you do have the slides, which are probably not going to help you because they're really small too. So I'll just read some of the bigger ideas. So this is chemistry. Um, so the big idea, right, changes in matter involve the rearrangement or reorganization of atoms and or the transfer of electrons. That's a, that's a big idea in, in chemistry. Uh, what do we want and for an enduring understanding? So those of you familiar with understanding by design and Wiggins and McTeague, so it sounds a little bit familiar. Um, chemical changes are represented by a balanced, uh, are represented by a balanced chemical reaction that identifies the ratios with which reactants react and products form. Those are some of the bigger ideas. But you say, if that's all you do, then you're left wanting to figure out like, all right, so that's nice. We want that. How do I get kids there? And so then you have these supporting understandings that are important to develop. And I just listed a, a few excerpts. I didn't do all of them, but for instance, uh, chemical change may be represented by a molecular ionic or net ionic equation. So it's not as big as what I just read as a big idea, but you, you have to actually understand how to do that to be able to get to that big idea. Uh, solid solutions, particularly if semiconductors provide important non stoichiometric compounds. Um, these materials have useful applications and electronic technology provide an important extension of the concept of stoichi stoichiometry beyond the whole uh, number mole ratio concept. So how many people in the room understand that? Just a few over here, I know. <laughs> Before you move on, Scott, something that strikes me um, with this uh, student model is that uh, it models our competencies pretty nicely, at least in math. We've got the big idea, which is the competency, and then under that we have the I can statements that make up how that looks when students actually can or know that competency. So, um, so that's a nice parallel for the math books. Exactly. And so um, then you actually even go further down, right, and, and do this. Um, this is some sample skills from the uh, uh, from science. You know, evaluate scientific questions. This actually will ring true for a lot of stuff in the uh, the nature of science. We apply mathematical routines to quantities to describe natural phenomena. And again, 
you could get get really OCD on this stuff and, and really specify it out. And I'm not suggesting we go all the way to that level, but it is it's what you find, especially when you're working in groups, is that I could I could say apply mathematical routines to quantities that describe natural phenomena. And I could be working in a group of my three or four other colleagues, and we all think we know what that means. And then we actually start trying to list some of these. I didn't mean that. You meant that? And then you, then you, and so at the level where you have to come to a shared understanding, so we're clear about what we're expecting kids to know and be able to do. And it's, you know, because you have the big idea, I go back to the big ideas, um, right? So I could do that at third grade, I could do that at sixth grade, I could do that at twelfth grade, I could do that at graduate school, right? Um, but what do I really mean by that? That's where I have to start specifying these things out. And that's, that's really the challenge. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do, um, so actually this is, this is the other thing I want to talk about just very briefly. Um, so, and Ellen talked about this. She told you to stop obsessing about rubrics and so much. That's, that's a lot for English teachers. That's, that's, <laughs> and so and the reason I'm going to tell you is you could have a fabulous, so you're right. Uh, what would be your name again? Heather. Heather, I haven't seen you so I apologize. Right. Um, is uh, you can have a lousy rubric and a good test that it hurts you. But I learned this years ago when we were uh, establishing uh, performance levels on, uh, on, on large scale assessments and actually Stu Cull works in Measure Pro founded Measure Progress, one of the founders is on, so, so on our tack for PACE, that's right, as a technical advisory committee. Um, said, so, you know, it's one thing to have a description of advanced performance, and then it's another thing to actually generate evidence from kids of advanced performance. Because if you don't have any evidence, you can't give anybody an advanced rating, a level four on the Right on the whether it's smart or balanced, or in that case it was a Wyoming assessment or the kneecap, and so we might see this focus on the rubrics, and this is what level four work we want to look like. But our task never asks kids to produce that kind of work, and so what we're trying to drive to is it's figuring out how to elicit the kind of complex thinking we want through the task, and then we could actually have the rubrics to, or their general rubrics that we could tighten up to score or, or creating task specific rubrics if, if that's where the direction goes. But it's, it's, you have to be able to elicit the work first. And we, we, we sometimes skip over that. And I know that it sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people, but it's, you can't just get there by having a complex rubric. I don't know if this speaks directly to this, but when we did the musical instrument um, grade eight science task, the pilot, um, we, we, were had, we had kids who were able to create a beautiful instrument that could actually play the eight notes, so they accomplished that goal. Uh, but then one of the things we realized is that we're not going to send these instruments to the state for people to see. <laughs> They're not going to know that they made this instrument. They will, but by the drawings, but they didn't actually see it. So that what they were sending is this packet with all this written information and reflection and all this stuff. And we had really intelligent kids who were able to do the, the task part, but then the write-up part was abysmal. I mean, it was, we called people back in to say, to these kids that we knew were really good writers, to say, you didn't even answer the question. You just left it blank. Like, what are you yeah. doing? And um, so we were like thinking there was something really wrong with the task. And, something that you know, was just wrong. But then the second year when we did it, we decided we would dedicate a week after they had finished making the instrument to just writing, just finishing the writing. And kind of, even if they didn't need that whole week, right. they had a week to write up all of the stuff they needed to write up to send away, you know, to send to the state. And the, really the assessment piece. And so we understood afterwards that we didn't give them, in the first pilot, Task, we didn't give them the emphasis to say, okay, there's going to be this big written part you have to do afterwards. We really focused on, you know, building the production part of it. Right. Yeah. And so the second year, now this year, we got beautiful results and, Good. you know, really nice writing and the results, you know, were so much, the understanding was so much better than we, that we could see as evidence. So sometimes it's not the rubric, it's just the understanding the timeline, you know, or 
type of things in the presentation. So there's other parts of you know, just piloting it and then in the second year that you don't understand until you've done it with the kids. But I, I would actually argue that you at least implicitly backed into this evidence model piece to say, what's evidence of students being able to, to actually demonstrate what we hope they're able to demonstrate? And, it's, and at that point you said it's not just a production of the thing, which is great, uh, but it's also actually being able to describe it, analyze it, related to its key scientific and engineering principles. and so. That's the, the evidence model there, the whole package. And what you did in the first year, it sounds like, is you, you, only, you only focused on a part of that. You yeah. didn't get the whole thing. And so, I mean, it, it is sort of backing into this evidence center design, which is good. And we, we should figure out a way to how to capture these uh, yeah. productions in, you know, with, uh, yeah. with either video or, or, or still pictures. All right, so here you got uh, 35 minutes to practice. So I think that um, you might want to work in content area groups. We could have, uh, it's not great for this, but uh, don't anybody trip over the camera, but maybe if we put the math teachers on this side of the room, maybe uh, this. So then we kind of settle on like, okay, well, obviously math numbers, and then, okay, well, what about numbers? What are they going to be doing? So we talked about starting with ratios and fractions and getting up to proportions, so as a little kid comparing, you know, okay, well, we're going to compare these couple of things, um, and we're going to start building a fraction, and then, you know, and then you get into building a ratio, and then you get into building proportions, so we kind of went off that, so we all had something to bring, um, and so we ran with that and started creating big ideas and enduring understandings. Um, we continue? So we came up with this. Um, our big idea is that we went with proportional understanding involves quantities being compared and analyzing relationships. And so we went back and forth and we said, okay, well that's a good start. Uh, so then we went with, uh, tried, okay, well let's come up with an un during, during understanding. I wrote down to see Jen's idea. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> after going around a bit, um, we came up with, uh, and we used the science example that is in the book, uh, students what we would want them to know. Students, that students recognize proportional relationships in real life situations and are able to solve real world problems involving proportion. So that was kind of what we came up with. Very broad, K to 12. Right, and so that's great, that's great. Then you would, you know, for grade four or three, you would, you would hone in on that a little more, add some specificity. Oh, right, we we'll talk about the science guys. Like imagine if you could like, peel back and look inside the kid's head, right? And the kid who really has this, like, what is it, what is the constellation of knowledge and skills? That, and that's actually a great starting process um, to get to. And Chris had, because we're also like, oh, going back and forth and brought up, you know, okay, let's also get down, because there's a lot of things we wanted to put in there. Like, oh, do we need to mention this? Do we need to mention that? And so we're like, okay, maybe we, you know, start adding things in, you know, it, you wanted to go through the process, but sometimes you want to kind of draw arrows to, okay, let's get some supporting understandings yeah. down as well. That's right, and so um, getting to, uh, you know, figuring out what are these supporting understandings within the hierarchy of the, the level of understandings, and you know, what are concepts, declarative knowledge, what are the skills that they need to bring, and how do they weave together. But that's, building that is, it's different than just starting with the task, right? Saying, I got the standard, I want to get a task, right? So it's really, what about ELA? What you guys have? That, that's terrific work in a short amount of time. It's meant, it's not meant for you to solve all the world's problems. It's meant to give you a little practice. We want to take it to July. Exactly. Yeah. Who's, who's speaking over there? I did Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Really, why do we have kids do narrative writing? 
And so there was, you know, some discussion about that. That took a little while um, to get to, but we got there. We're English teachers, so we do get stuck <laughs> on jargon. We do get stuck on word choice a little bit. So um, we had to continue to kind of move along with that. And that was good helping um, with that. But then we started talking about, um, you know, uh, what is narrative writing? You know, what would the expectations be? How there really is necessarily no right way to write um, narrative writing when we start talking about grade level. Um, kinds of things again um, and then we came to uh, the kinds of things that we would expect mm -hmm. you know, what what does the fact of technique mean um, what is a uh, clear sequence um, uh, having a narrator uh, having a you know um, a writer would have to establish that a purpose um, for their narrative writing and who their audience is going to be but the bigger idea really was um, to communicate an interesting story that engages um, an audience and um, holds their attention. And then we talked about, um, let's see, it was a little bit all over the place. We were scattered. Uh, and, oh, and how we kind of, uh, then we went further into those ideas and how we learn about ourselves through the stories and how we use stories to connect to people and communities. Um, we share our imagination, our life experiences, and what is inspired us as so a lot of that would fall work. under these supporting ideas, right? It's like, you know, what does it mean at first the big idea I think was right. an accurate one, right? right? And then a lot of these things support it in terms of both in terms of purpose and then you'll be weaving in skills, right? You right. actually have to have something, you know, have have a theme that runs through it that already keep the reader engaged, right? Yeah, the paragraphs and stuff yeah, need to make sense, it. right? So that's but that's I, it's exactly that's getting at it, and I, I think it helps unpack it. So it's, it's Thirty-five minutes is not going to be enough time. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, 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 I was going to have you do the whole ECD process at 35 minutes. I don't know what exactly. took you guys so long. So, at science, we had uh, little struggles. We uh, we got a little sidetracked because we we had some uh, uh, realizations about that. I think we need some we need a little it was, rubric. It was word choice also. Word choice. Really. Right. <laughs> That's, that's right. We do need some rubric sure. tweaking, we think, in science, uh, because you know, the nature of science doesn't capture enough of the content. I think we could work on it and get that. But we did, we did get there. We actually had part of it was taking away the, from the exercise that the word competency, because that only does focus in science on these cross-cutting concepts. So once we just talked about big ideas, we started honing in on it pretty quickly. I don't know if somebody wants to. Yeah, we just decided to play with the second law as our example and talk about demonstrating how it works, being able to mathematically represent it, transfer it to a new situation, and, no, and this, then we got to more basics, like, do you know what all the letters mean? Do you know what all the units are? Do you know how to measure each part of it? That kind of thing. And then we thought it connected to the bigger, the other, well, what we're doing is the competency cause and effect, even though the concept is like, big laws, yeah. So we, we do like, we. A little sidetrack, but we actually did. Uh, once we did, we got honed in on some of the ideas. But I just, I, I, we didn't even get into the evidence model. Right? No. We're just thinking about like <laughs> in, in any group, it's just like no, the student did. model. No, yeah. nobody did. And again, it was it was uh, abbreviated. But this idea of thinking through, and this is the work that we're gonna you know work with you and provide some support on engaging your groups on um, starting on the 27th and then subsequently is, is not rush to the task, right? Let's be clear about what we care about the students knowing and doing, and, and the, then we'll get to producing a task that elicits the evidence that would convince us that the students know we can do that. And I, I guarantee you we'll have richer, more engaging tasks from that. And then we'll provide support for rubric development. Total. We're going to support you all the way through. <laughs> so, uh, questions, comments, thoughts, reactions, lunch. Uh, so, uh, just so you know, uh, all right. um, so I actually had a slide on that. See? Uh, uh, but, so, uh, what we have now is we have lunch, then Marianne's going to do a presentation on facilitation. And then we'll talk about task quality. And then Ellen will wrap us up with 
marching orders mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day. So thank you for uh, a good morning. I appreciate it. And so grab your ladders, any directions on lunch?